I've been a problem solver my whole life, and I just love it. And the thing I really, really love is making big, hairy, complex problems and questions simple. Finding that core essence, that core insight, and driving to impact. The problem I'm currently obsessed with is how to democratize access and scale human engagement and connection such that we all can thrive. It's no secret that there are a lot of people left out of today's conversation. And even those that are in the conversation are doing a lot more self-editing. I believe in a meritocracy. I believe that the best ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. I believe that there's a durable path forward where we can remove bias, both personal and confirmational and the opportunity for us to step away from our attachment to status, such that we can increase the solution space and allow everyone to be included. I'm always looking for analogies or parallels of where a problem has been solved in one context and we can borrow it and apply it to another one. Who has been successful in the past? Where has it been proven out? And it turns out, in this case, the natural world has figured this out and serves as a great source of insight and inspiration. I love the solitude of walking in the woods, surrounded by trees that are hundreds of years old, the sunlight creeping in, casting shadows, changing colors, birds chirping, insects buzzing, it's easy to get lost in the quiet and the tempo of your feet hitting the forest floor. In reality, the forest is not very quiet. While most of us are looking forward or looking above, underneath our feet is a vast, secretive, democratized, social network of trees. All of the trees, regardless of species, sustained by a complex labyrinth of roots, bacteria, and fungi, connecting everything together. Biologists call this the wood wide web because adult trees can share sugars with younger trees. Sick trees can send resources back into the network for others to leverage. And they all can communicate with one another with respect to dangers like insect infestations. This is happening and has been happening for more than 450 million years because it's in the best interests of both parties to engage, to listen to one another, and to be rewarded in order to thrive. Now, I want you to keep this image, this picture in your head of this hidden, vastly effective system underneath your feet and think about how we might apply it to how we communicate, how we engage with one another. The opportunity to create connection, speed, and scale of authentic engagement between widely diverse populations that may have been separated for any number of reasons. Their geography, the color of their skin, neurological or physical diversity, schools of thought, religion, age, gender, the list goes on and on. I mean, how hard can this be? Technology and social media have certainly made some things better. There's much more awareness, but the gap has been amplified. Our ability to broadcast has expanded, but our ability to listen has collapsed. The power online is held by those on Twitter with blue check marks, those whose influencer ranks are defined by their number of followers. We have the opportunity to bring people together. We have the opportunity to reimagine existing algorithms where the democratized crowd dictates the answer, that being the only goal. This problem is solvable. The piece parts exist. They just need to be put together. Technology nor intent 
is holding us back. The reason this problem hasn't been solved before is because the status quo has not yet been challenged. Communication, whether we're talking about people or trees, is about math. When you're talking to one person, that's basic math, one plus one. But as soon as you start talking to three, four, five, not to mention large groups of 50, 100, 1,000, that becomes exponential. And exponential means that regardless of intent or intellect, you only have the physical capacity to hear a few. And those few tend to be the most senior, the most extroverted, and the loudest. So instead of everyone, like the trees, a very small percentage gets heard. The great news is math problems can be solved. I believe in an abundant world, a world of shared prosperity, a world where everyone is sitting on the same side of the table, working to find solutions to problems that have the potential to make our lives legitimately better. Yes, the pace of change has never been faster, the level of complexity never higher, the level of ambiguity never greater, and perhaps the degree of divisiveness in our culture never wider. In these moments that are sometimes stressful and sometimes scary, people are looking to the leaders of organizations for the answers. They're the people with the agenda. They're the people with the five-year plan. They must have the path forward. We need to challenge this assumption. It's not the leaders. It's not me who's going to know all the problems to solve, all the questions to ask, and certainly not have all the answers. It's up to all of us the small business owner on the west side of Chicago, the farmer in India, the entrepreneur in Japan, the college student in Venezuela, the literal democratization of access to prioritize the problems that need to be solved, to frame the questions that need to be debated, to engage in that debate and work to find solutions to the problems impacting the 99% and to be rewarded psychically, reputationally, financially for their participation. With the pairing of people and technology, there's nothing we can't conquer. This is not about intention or intellect. This is about math. Now, I want you to think about a room you were in in the last three or four days, in real life or virtually. Who was framing the discussion? Who was engaging in the dialogue? Was it 5% or 10%? Let's be optimistic and say it was 10%. So in a room of 30, three people were asking the questions. Three people were engaging in the dialogue. And three people got all the glory. In this example, three people were responsible for solving all of the problems. Now let's imagine that same room where all of the brain power is activated, engaged, and harnessed into a shared community problem-solving engine, a shared brain operating at 100% capacity, a shared brain that, much like the wood wide web, encourages people to participate, listens to everyone, and rewards everyone for their participation. A shared brain that ensures representation, that does not care what your zip code is, what the number on your paycheck is, what the color of your skin is, or what religion you practice. A shared brain that rebalances power, legitimately making inclusion a reality, not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the only way we are going to thrive just like the trees. I run 1871, the number one ranked private tech incubator in the world. I lead a community of more than 2,000 builders and innovators. My job, my literal job every day is to create the conditions for everyone to thrive. And I wanted to test this theory. Could I tap into the collective intelligence the shared community brain of 1871. 
Last November, I had a question. I wanted to know what the community thought we should do as we emerged from the pandemic. What does the post-COVID 1871 look like? I gave some constraints, some boundary conditions, but I really wanted to hear from the people that were experiencing it. I wanted to hear what they thought we should do. So we ran an experiment. We tested an actual algorithm. The community members submitted their ideas anonymously. Just like the trees, there's no bias, no hierarchy in who gets to participate, who gets to be heard, and who gets to be rewarded. Those ideas were then evaluated by the community, ideas that range from 1% better to massive transformations and everything in between. The experiment worked. We tapped into the collective 1871 brain. The crowd chose the top five winners, five people representing the diversity of our community, including a junior person on my team, a mentor, a, a university partner, a venture capitalist, and a founder building a business. A remarkable representation of the diversity of the 1871 network. Those five winners were then celebrated in social media, received 1871 swag, a gift card, among various other adulations. My idea, my idea also submitted anonymously, also evaluated by the crowd, came in near the bottom. And if that is not proof in the pudding, I don't know what is. Now let's zoom out. Let's apply this concept at scale. And let's use the city of Chicago, the place I call home, a metro area of almost 9 million people as our backdrop. And instead of 10% or 900,000 people contributing, a number, by the way, that is likely way too generous and highly centralized in the, in the local business district, assume that all 9 million people are engaged. Every Chicagoan part of an interconnected web. Each person a dot, an equal dot connected into a network, leveraging an algorithm and the abundant community that can look at any problem from as many different perspectives as there are people. There is no problem too big for Chicago's brain. Gun violence, education, public health, transportation, safe housing, clean water. We're all just a few connections and computations away from being solved. Chicago's brain follows the same formula as the wood wide web. The more roots, bacteria, and fungi that are connected, the faster and more effective the processing power. The total output of our city could be measured by the percentage of the population that is engaged, active, and rewarded in the conversation. In less than two years, the entire global population of nearly 8 billion people is expected to be connected to the internet. What might we be able to solve when we activate the global brain? Think about where you live and where you work. What problems do you think are the most important to solve? What questions do you think need to be asked? What might you be able to create, discuss, build, if you were able to engage everyone. Now this idea of leveraging the wisdom of a crowd is not a new one. The idea of a shared brain that scales, an algorithm complemented by a community of relationships and an incentive structure throughout the entire discussion is the next wave of innovation. We are in crisis and it's time to act. Let's mimic the trees, each of us a node connected to one another, combining forces in order for all of us to thrive. I invite you to imagine the power of a shared brain for Chicago or wherever you work or live and how we all can thrive with the other 90% engaged. <laughs>